think about the etiology and pathogenesis of infant gut cataracts. As you know from literature, cataract is the most common cause of treatable childhood blindness. There are about 200,000 children blind from cataract worldwide. So, to start with the pathogenesis of infant gut cataract, it may be insult during embryogenesis. This is the neural tube, and this is a part of a forebrain. During intrauterine life, it becomes vivid like that. And then, from the frontal part of the uh, forebrain, starts a vesicle on both sides, which is going to be the future eye. And these are the vesicles, optic vesicles, both sides to form, and this is the stalk, and this is the ventral ectoderm, and surface ectoderm. This is a magnified picture, you have ectoderm and surface ectoderm. Then the surface ectoderm becomes thickened like that, invaginating the disc and becoming a sort of a half cup like that. And this is the future lens. The future lens is actually surrounded by a cloidal layer of epithelium together with the vesicle inside. These cuboidal the layer protrudes into the vesicle to form the lens. If you were to take the lens go here with a magnified picture, we're going to see laying down of the future lens fibers come from the lens go. So during intrauterine life, the embryonic nucleus is formed, and then later on, the lens fibers are being introduced from the lens go periphery. So any insult during this embryogenesis gonna lead to cataract. Maybe intratogenic drug, maybe irradiation, maybe a disease like for example measles. This concerning the first issue. If we come to the second issue, that is insult altering lens anatomy. Like what? Oh. We all know that the lens is from this is cut section of the lens, this is the capsule, and we have the epithelium just underneath the capsule. And these lens becomes a, this, this is the site of the lens that forms the future fibers, the epithelial cells, they lose their nuclei and become condensed toward the center. Any insult curing this anatomy, like for example trauma damaging the lens capsule, damaging the, the cortical fibers which are arranged perfectly like that, can lead to cataract in children. The third insult is altering the lens biochemistry. The lens concerning the biochemistry have proteins, certain proteins, and they are called crystallines. They may be subgroups, they may be polypeptides, they may be membrane protein or cytoskeletal protein, and they are actually mainly specified inside the lens, and they are only present inside the lens. Anything that alters the pathogenesis of these proteins inside the lens may cause cataract. The lipids inside the lens is sphingomyelin, and actually they are attached to the protein. They have to be attached to the protein. And this protein lipid complex is incorporated in the cell membrane of the cell. So anything that alters the composition of the lipids or the arrangement of the lipids may lead to congenital cataract. And finally, insult altering the lens metabolism. We have an active transport system, and this is present in the lens epithelial cell. The function of this active transport system to maintain hydration of the lens, to control the hydration of the lens in order to be a vascular for the sake of vision. There should be, the calcium level should be 550 times less than, inside the lens, less than the aqueous humor. How? By, by what is called calcium antiphase enzyme. And this enzyme actually is very sensitive to oxidative damage. So any oxidative damage to the lens may lead to cataract. And also there is protein transport system which provides continuous supply of amino acids to maintain protein tenses, to maintain the clarity of the lens. Anything that interferes with the protein transport system may lead to cataract. And also we have a using system and detoxification enzymes, like the catalase, the glutathione, the tripeptide, and these are produced inside the lens. Any damage or anything that interferes with these enzymes, like for example, 
uh, some diseases may cause oxidative damage and may lead to cataracts. Therefore, concerning the pathogenesis of pediatric cataract, it is quite unknown, and many theories concerning this, altering this embryology, biochemistry, or some complex metabolic pathways will cause degradation of the structural integrity of the lens and hence loses its transparency. The second thing, we're going to classify the cataract according to the etiology. We have the congenital cataract, the infantile, developmental cataract, traumatic, and drug-induced. And we're going to say, take some examples. Congenital cataract, actually here, is a congenital, is a cataract, and the baby is born with this cataract. So the etiology here may be actually a sort of during something that happened during embryogenesis. Infantile cataract is the cataract which develops or observed during the first year of life or during the second year of life. Developmental cataract is the cataract that occurs after the age of two years. Traumatic cataract is the cataract caused by different types of trauma that may be penetrating, something entering inside the eye and the EOC and the corneal wound, causing direct damage to the lens capsule. And the penetrating trauma may be tiny as a pinprick, causing damage to the lens, or maybe large and extensive corneal sclera wound. Or non-penetrating trauma, causing what is called concussion cataract. Trauma also may be irradiation. The mother may be exposed to irradiation, but this is going to be a teratogenic effect during pregnancy, or the child is exposed to irradiation, for example, if it has a retinoblastoma or any tumors, exposed to head irradiation, or maybe laser for, for treating retinoblastoma or retinopathy of prematurity. Drug induced may be systemic corticosteroids, and actually it's a cumulative process. The child should receive 1,000 mg prednisolone in a cumulative process. For example, here, as this child, there is abuse of systemic triosteroids because he has a bronchial asthma, and we see here the tinea versicolor from the low immunity causing damage to the legs and consequently drug-induced cataract. We will speak about a little bit details about the infantile cataract. Infantile cataract may be present in one eye, unilateral, or may be present in both eyes, unilateral, bilateral. For the unilateral cases, the etiology most, most probably is unknown. In bilateral cases, 38% the etiology is unknown, and 56% is hereditary. And only 6% collectively all these together, chromosomal anomalies, systemic metabolic disorders, intrauterine infections, or maybe associated with other congenital ocular abnormalities, and we're gonna see some examples. This is 56%, the mother gave a history of congenital cataract, while examining her baby has a congenital cataract. Again, a mother and her child, a father and his son. And astonishingly enough, while examining the father, we observed the same morphological type of pediatric cataract. Mm. This is a twin sister. The whole family is affected with congenital cataract, the aunt, the father, the uncle, and the grandmother. And here, <laughs> six children, they are brothers and sisters, all having congenital cataract, which is a very common thing to see it in Egypt. So hereditary is most commonly autosomal dominant mode of inheritance. However, in a country like Egypt, we see autosomal recessive inheritance. And the most common autosomal recessive inheritance is galactosemia. And the most common X-linked inheritance is Lewy syndrome. What are the, the most common chromosomal abnormalities that may cause congenital cataract? These are Down syndrome or trisomy 21, Pateau syndrome or trisomy 13, Edward syndrome or trisomy 18, Turner's syndrome XO, and Finally, which is uncommon, which is Hreyt-Vishala syndrome. Down syndrome here, we see congenital cataract as early as few hours as this baby, while examining his eyes, he has congenital cataract. Few days old, down with congenital cataract. Few months with congenital cataract. Maybe observed in the first decade of life. 
in the second decade of life, in the third, in the fourth decade of life, and even in the fifth decade of life. So therefore, Down syndrome routinely should be examined for congenital cancer because they will not complain. And these children, when we go early for surgery, we prevent blindness, which is actually an added to their uh, problem. Moreover, they have slanting eyes, upward slanting eyes like that. They have small mouth, mouth micrognathia, and protruding tongue. Brush field spots in the iris, together with the cataract. And also, the cataract is a very common feature. And then when we go very early, as early as few weeks surgery, it is possible to prevent blindness in these children, as in this baby. We did operate surgery when he was just three weeks old, and now he's two years, he is doing fine concerning heritage. And they are very cooperative in epilepsy therapy also. As in this town baby who had surgery when he was six months old with uh, eye rod implantation, and he's very cooperative with the epilepsy therapy. Trisomy 13 or Pinto syndrome. They usually present with, here, as you see this, cleft lip, together with cleft palate, extensive cleft palate in another, in another baby, small head, this is a microcephaly, and polydactyly. If you see here, there are six fingers, and sometimes it is a rudimentary finger like that, polydactyly of the toes, and sometimes syndactyly, these are fused together, or overriding of toes together with iris collarbone. And in the hair, there is an area of loss of hair, and we call this alopecia. Partial trisomy, which, is, which we see it commonly coming from the genetics department, uh, partial uh, trisomy, and also called Pinto syndrome, Congenital cataract, together with congenital glaucoma. If you see the ears, they are small, low-set ears, lacrimal problems, large, broad nose, and there is a distance, large distance between <coughs> the nose and the mouth. Another baby with partial trisomy, the, the nose is very characteristic. It is large and wide like that, and this actually, the area here from the nose to the lip is very wide. Together with the cataract, here, an iris coloboma. And also, in other child, there is thick eyebrows, and they are continuous with each other. And we call this cyanophorus. With the alopecia syndactyly and a very characteristic sign, we have the foot, it is rounded like that, and we call it a rocker bottom foot. Edward syndrome, or trisomy 18. They usually present with congenital cataract, and they have this feet, they are actually crossed over each other. And in this baby, can you see these abnormalities in the feet crossing each other? And another baby like that. With clenched hands, and there is overriding of the finger, the thumb over the third finger, and a large occiput, the small low set ears, and a horseshoe kidney. Turner syndrome, together with the congenital cataract, very char characteristic large nose, this is called webbed neck, and a low hairline. It is very low here, and this is a triangular neck like that. And they are usually short stature, and abnormalities in very long hands, and forearms, and the arms like that, and abnormalities in the elbow. You should suspect Turner syndrome. We are not actually dealing with the syndromes in details. We are just picking some important signs with the common syndromes that you may face even in your practice. And if you should look to the chest, usually they have a depression in the chest and it is called pectus excavatum. And in infants, we should suspect that the baby has a, uh, an, a turner when we have edema of the foot and the fingers, and this is due to lymph edema. When to suspect intrauterine infection, and what are, that are the most common intrauterine infection that you may see, these are the torch disease. TO stands for toxoplasmosis, R for rubella syndrome, C, cytomegal virus, and H for herpes. If I have a baby with small eyes like that, 
microcornea and small axial length microphthalmus together with hearing defects and heart problems, I should suspect Robella syndrome. And if you look to the eyes, you will see a pinpoint pupil, undilatable pupil. It doesn't dilate to the vitreatics. And if you look to the cataract, it is pearly white nuclear cataract. You should suspect Robella syndrome. When to suspect cytomegalovirus infection, if you have a baby like that, skeletal abnormalities, congenital cataract, failure to thrive, he's very ill, and some of them have jaundice, together with hepatosplenomegaly. Think of cytomegalovirus infection. Metabolic disorders. Galactosemia may cause congenital cataract, hypoglycemia, or diabetes related, and hypocalcemia. Galactosemia, there is a deficiency in galactose one phosphate uridine transferase or galactogynase enzymes. This may lead to accumulation of galactose four phosphate in the blood. This will be converted into galactitol inside the lens. So the osmotic pressure will be increased inside the lens. Consequently, there is influx of water causing disruption of the lens fibers and finally causing cataract. This is a baby with galactosemia. But there is something important about galactosemia if you are faced with such a child, that if you give the baby galactose-free diet, this cataract may be reversible. If you look here, this is the same baby after treatment, the cataract actually is marked, decreased in density, and it may even disappear. So you don't have to go for surgery early in these cases. Hypoglycemia, hypocalcemia, they usually present with a mellow cataract failure to thrive and convulsions. If you look to this baby, there is what is called carpopetal spas. Carpopetal spas due to hypocalcemia, and it's called tetany. If you examine his eyes, this is a bilateral congenital cataract. <coughs> Renal diseases may cause, may be associated with congenital cataract as Lewy syndrome, Alpert syndrome, or nephrotic syndrome. But nephrotic syndrome is not associated with congenital cataract or pediatric cataract is actually associated with cataract when the baby there is a sort of high doses of systemic steroids. This is a Lewy syndrome. This is an called oculocerebral renal syndrome. They usually present with congenital cataract and congenital glaucoma with microcephaly and mental retardation. What is Lewy? It is an inborn error of amino acid metabolism and is usually presented with amino acid that goes into urine, it's amino aciduria. And what is Alpert and what to suspect, this is a type four collagen disorder, and there is affection of the kidneys with hematuria, together with deafness and cataract. When to suspect when we have anterior venticonus, there is a marked protrusion of the lens four, or protrusion of the lens like that, and sometimes it is so severe that is associated with lenticular astigmatism, even if the lens is transparent to go for surgery because the high astigmatism is not angled to be corrected by spectacles. Blood diseases like TAR syndrome. This is a very rare syndrome. And worldwide, actually, they did report only four cases. And in Alexandria, we have three cases among the past 10 years. This is called the thrombocytopenia with absent radii. So there is marked thrombocytopenia. If you look here to the x-ray, there is absent radius. And this is how the baby's head and forearm and the arm appears. It is deviated like that. Of course, before surgery and during surgery and after surgery, he should be given uh, blood and plasma and platelets. And this is immediately after surgery. Can you see the subconjunctival hemorrhage? simply from the injection we give at the end of surgery. And in these cases, we should not go for aridectomy if you want to go for a peripheral aridectomy because bleeding may occur and it may be inevitable. And here, the same baby a few months after surgery. Another baby with TAR syndrome, look at actually his hands with the same abnormality in the arm and forearm, his other arm. Another baby with TAR syndrome, again, and this is immediately after surgery, and here a few months after surgery. Digital anomaly may be affected or may be associated with congenital cataract, as Bart 